Welcome to this afternoon's session and free papers. We had a great uh, morning um, when we had our first four free papers this morning. Um, this afternoon we've got four speakers and we're aiming for eight minutes with two minutes questions. An opportunity please to ask and to debate. And our first speaker this afternoon is Marjolene Woodhouse and you can find her abstract on abstract uh, 24 and Marjolene is presenting the effect of lateral rotation and 30, 30 degree side lying position in tissue viability. Thank you very much. Thank you. So it's recommended in the guidelines that we reposition our patients at risk of pressure ulcer development um, using the 30 degree side lying position which I've shown there. However, this may be difficult and in a recent study um, it was found that 56% of patients at risk of pressure ulcers in patients weren't regularly repositioned. And in a community setting, um, that may be more difficult still with um, sporadic care packages. Um, so automated lateral rotation devices can provide an alternative to manual repositioning, but very little research has examined the effectiveness of these devices. So the aim of this study was to compare lateral rotation and lateral rotation system or a lateral rotation platform which is shown in the picture there which is placed under the mattress and will inflate periodically to mimic manual repositioning and to compare that against the 30 degree side lying position which is recommended in current guidelines. And to assess whether that was effective um, I, I use transcutaneous gas tension measurements so that's transcutaneous oxygen and carbon dioxide interface pressures, which I'm not reporting on here, um, and inclinometer measurements to uh, measure the turn angle, and I also asked various comfort questions. So these are my participants. So 11 participants aged between 23 and 60 years old, with a good range of BMIs, I think, um, and uh, the turn angles are shown there as well. So that shows that um, although on the picture at the bottom it, it looks like the lateral rotation platform actually has quite a big turn angle on it, and I think that might be something to do with the angle that I took the picture at, actually the turn angle um, was quite a lot lower. So on the 30 degree tilt it was 27.1 degree mean turn angle, which I was quite proud of because we don't stand there in practice with an inclinometer to check if our turn angle is 30 degree. Um, and with the lateral rotation platform, um, the turn angle at the pelvis was 8.6 degree. So um, then to analyse the data, I focused on transcutaneous oxygen tensions. And um, there's been a, um, a study a little while ago which combined transcutaneous oxygen tensions with sweat metabolites. And it found that once the um, oxygen levels were 40% or less of basal levels, there was an increase in sweat, la sweat lactate and carbon dioxide. So I, I define that as low oxygen levels. But I thought, you know, lactate and increases in carbon dioxide, that's really rather low. So I, if it was a patient, I would want to intervene before that. So I... Um, I took all my baseline levels and applied percentage increments and decided that actually after there was um, a reduction of 65% or less, after transcutaneous oxygen levels were 65% or less of basal levels, I would want to intervene. So um, everything over that I defined as high and so anything in between those earlier parameters I defined as intermediate levels. And then I classified all the, um, both sessions, all the data. Um, so this shows, in the, in the corner there, it shows for volunteer A, um, it shows for the, for the lateral rotation platform, they generally had very little response, so they, they ha they, their oxygen levels maintained were fa fairly high throughout. And during the this, this same protocol with the same, during the second protocol with the same volunteer, the, um, again, the oxygen levels remained fairly high. And so I classified for each um, position, for each volunteer. Um, and I think it shows there's a cluster, volunteers D, E and F, um, and they, incidentally, were the volunteers with the lowest BMI. But apart from that, there was really no obvious trend. And something else that surprised me was really that during the term position, particularly with manual repositioning, 
um, I was expecting that the oxygen levels would, would stay high, but actually on the, on the volunteers with a lower BMI, that wasn't always the case, as, that, as this shows. So these are the sacrum. So then at, at, the, at the shoulder, I also measured at the right shoulder, actually there was no rhyme or reason as to who responded why. The only trend I could find was that volunteer C was also the volunteer with the highest BMI, and so that the oxygen levels really um, stayed very stable throughout. You can see a cluster around the um, facing right position, and that's because the, the electrode was placed on the right shoulder. Um, and, and most of those recovered during the supine position, both using the lateral rotation protocol and manual repositioning. And so this compares the responses um, of, of the transchange oxygen for both protocols at the sacrum and also the scapula. So at the top, um, it shows the lateral rotation platform, total responses, and directly underneath it shows for manual repositioning. Um, and so if we look at these graphs, really, we can see very little difference in tissue response between the two. And when I compared each response for every volunteer in, um, from session one to session two, actually none of those differences were significant. So they tended to have the same tissue response, no matter how they were repositioned. Um, and I also asked comfort questions. Um, now, I do know that, obviously, healthy volunteers um, in an artificial situation that are being asked to lie still, you can't really extrapolate that to patients. But what I found very surprising was that a, a lot of uh, volunteers actually really didn't like being repositioned. And I would argue that if a healthy volunteer doesn't like it, then perhaps a patient wouldn't like it either. Um, and I hadn't really considered that before, that we do these things because guidelines recommend um, and I hadn't really considered that, actually, it may not be well received. Um, and, and generally, there were two camps. Um, there were volunteers that were quite happy either which way, whether it was repositioning by the lateral rotation platform or manual repositioning, or there were those that had a clear preference. And when they had a clear preference, it was always in the direction of the lateral rotation platform. So when I compared those responses um, for both the left-facing and the right-facing turns, they were both significant, suggesting that patients pref um, volunteers preferred the lateral rotation platform for repositioning. So in conclusion, so the, the oxygen levels um, shown at, uh, observed that the sacrum and the shoulder were very similar between both protocols, and, and there was a trend in increased comfort um, when repositioned by the lateral rotation platform protocol. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marjorie. Any questions on this? No questions? Thank you, Ria. Hi. Um, my question is about, you've marked it for sacral and shoulder. Did you mention heels? No, um, we only measured two because the electrodes don't actually measure the entire body. It's, it's where you fix them. So I've only measured at the, the right shoulder and the sacrum. Because okay, we've seen a bigger trend towards heel damage. Yeah. Um, and my concern is of putting people on lateral turning um, devices that actually the heels still remain vulnerable. Just yeah, but could you not do what you do with manual repositioning, whereas you offload them? So you could still do that. Um, yeah, you don't I'm look convinced. Thinking, no, I'm just thinking about clinic, in real clinic, in clinical practice. <laughs> if somebody's told that this actually, you, you put this in and people aren't going to need to be turned, yeah. they won't off necessarily follow through the process right. of offloading the heels at the same time. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Marjorie. Thank you. The second speaker is Julie Green. And you can find her presentation in abstract number 19. And Julie is from Keele University talking about new quality of life consultation template for people with chronic venous leg ulcers. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, I've got eight minutes, um, and that works out at about a minute and a half per year of my PhD. So it's going to be a whistle-stop whistle tour. So I've, I've worked for five years. I've done four phases of research to develop a quality-of-life template. 
So I'm a district nurse by background, I still go out into clinical practice, and I accompanied a student to see Nellie. And Nellie lived in a village near to Keele University and had had a history of ulceration for 60 years. And we know they're recurrent, um, but 60 years just seemed amazing. She got a wedding photograph on the wall and she had bilateral bandages on and she was now 82, having carer's visit and still had bilateral bandages. She reflected of periods of time when she'd had healing, but they'd broken down again. And it really got me thinking to how much do we listen to the patient's story. And it echoes a lot of what Michelle said in her free paper before lunch. Do we listen? Do we take into account the quality of life issues whilst also providing that physical care? So I came in at it with four questions. So my first phase was to actually establish what those factors that impacted on quality of life were. There's been lots of other studies, but I really needed to find out from a group that I could follow through to their consultations, because I wanted to see with those same patients, did we actually address those concerns? So my second one was actual consultations. Were we actually looking at those issues that patients had? I then developed a template and I undertook a small scale pilot. So quick whistle stop, stop tour. I interviewed nine patients. I interviewed until saturation. Unstructured interviews just led with a question, tell me about your life with leg ulceration. I had a topic guide but never needed to use it. My biggest problem really was stopping some of the interviews because the transcription would have taken so long. I think my record was about just over two hours. Um, number of themes, they fell into four categories. So the ulcer, they all had their story. They all wanted to tell me about their family history, their comorbidity, how it recurred, where it occurred, and various things like that. They talked about their symptoms. Pain dominated, exudate and odour caused social isolation that was self-inflicted almost. Emotional effects were, were paramount really with poor self-esteem. They talked about wound management. They loved their nurse. They wanted continuity of their nurse. They wanted somebody who could reflect on how the ulcer was progressing. Um, they also, they wanted to be in partnership with their nurse in toward, towards this journey of healing. And then they talked about the effects on daily life. As a result of that, I constructed a consultation checklist. I wanted to go into the consultations and be as unobtrusive as possible whilst completing a checklist to see whether the factors that they raised were actually addressed. So there were 28 factors within the checklist and I rated them zero to five. So zero was if the patient didn't tell the nurse about it. And when we were discussing before lunch, do we listen to patients, the biggest surprise of my research for me was that patients don't always tell their nurse what they told me unprompted at interview. So a zero if the patient didn't raise it, a one if the, the nurse missed the cue. So the patient may have mentioned it, but the nurse was busy and didn't address it. A two if the nurse blocked it, so she acknowledged what they said but didn't proceed. A three if she had a chat about the issue but didn't actually problem solve. A four if it was partially dealt with. A five if it was completely dealt with. So out of the nine participants of phase one, I followed five through into phase two and I saw each of them on four occasions. I sat in a corner as unobtrusive as possible and completed my form. Again, they all talked about their story, which I won't go into detail. But in terms of the other elements, where they said it was a problem, I was amazed by the fact that on many occasions the patient never told the nurse at the consultation. And I think my PhD has raised more issues that need research rather than solving problems. It could be lots more studies because I don't actually know why they didn't tell their nurse. Did they not tell her because they tried before and there hadn't been any solution? It had been overlooked. Did they not tell her because they felt it was somebody else they should be telling? So I think it's a huge area to explore in terms of communication. On quite a lot of occasions, nurses discussed. So they may have discussed an issue but not moved on to a problem-solving approach. And on this occasion with pain, only 16% of occasions was a full solution offered. So that was pain. Exudate and odour, we offered a full solution on more occasions. And I think that's directly related to the very prevalence of that condition and, and it's unavoidable. If there's exudate and odour there, it, it's more than certainly going to have some discussion and possibly be addressed. Emotional issues were, were the most undisclosed area. So on 57% of occasions, the patients didn't tell the nurse what they told me at interview. And they told me issues about depression, low self-esteem. One even had suicidal thoughts because his ulceration had been so devastating to his life. And on 57% of occasions, they never told their nurse what they told me unprompted at interview. 
and only on 4% of occasions was a complete solution offered. In terms of wound management, they had very, very positive things to say about their nurses. They really valued the journey they were taking with their nurse. These were good quality nurses who were working at a high level and were giving lots of information to their patients. So they were quite happy in terms of nursing care. We were offering good levels of solutions. Then finally, in terms of impact on the effects on daily life, uh, mobility, working, personal hygiene, sleep, relationships, choices of clothes and shoes, they were all issues that affected daily life. 38% of times it wasn't raised during the consultation by the patient. Some discussion at 39%, only 8% was a full solution offered. As a result of all of this data, I had a nominal group, and I have got one member of my nominal group in the audience somewhere, a uh, nominal group of experts where we developed a template based on the issues that had been raised by patients. I then had it validated by some of the patient participants. They were going to be part of the nominal group, but they elected not to be in a group of experts. I saw them separately and fed back to the group, which, which that was their choice. And I developed a consultation template. So the template meets all of those areas that were raised in the initial interviews and that I observed whether they were raised or not raised during the consultation. Uh, it's tick box, two sides of A4, areas for comments and some guidance for nurses. And it doesn't change your wound care practice, it just changes the nature of the consultation to take into account quality of life issues. I undertook a small scale pilot. Small scale, I had nine patients. It took me nine or ten months to recruit those nine patients in a period of great change in the NHS. My PCTs had shrunk, they'd become CCGs, so massive area of change. But I had a small pilot over 18 weeks, um, very small effect size. If I was going to do an RCT now, I would need a very big sample size. But it did demonstrate improving outcomes of satisfaction and quality of life. And it did demonstrate that nurses liked it and patients liked it. And it wasn't repetition in terms of other notes they were completing. So just in conclusion, legal care goes beyond just wound care. It's the whole patient's life, basically. If they have those issues and they're not raising them during the consultation, we're missing out on a huge opportunity to address those needs. So something that actually directs the consultation hopefully will make sure that we do address them. Um, it's a very whistle-stop tour. There is a, a, a web page at Keele University that's got some more information, a couple of publications, and also you're able to just download the template if you want to look at it more closely. Thank you very much. That was eight minutes on the dot. Well, well done. A minute and a half uh, for each year. Uh, I think we've got time for one question, please. Oh, thank you, Michelle. Um, it's, it's a question and a comment. I'm bound to talk about the pain aspect. Um, it's really, did you find that it was interesting that the emotional aspects and the pain have similar sort of... Um, difficulties di disclosing because pain is an emotional experience yeah. so you could put those two things together I yeah think. it was just um, for every patient that I interviewed pain was the very very first thing they talked about and the thing that dominated their lives completely and it's not that long in venous ulceration that we've actually ever believed that they were painful so for these patients they they were in agony they lost sleep it dictated their lives so huge impact on emotional functioning as well but they were very, very quick to mention pain, which we weren't treating. So analgesia was ineffective. They, they weren't getting any relief from their pain. But yeah. It's, but it's, not quick to mention it in a consultation. No, no. But nurses didn't ask it either. Uh, there, was, there was some asking, but I feel that often we're very much led by a patient. I think district nursing is a very changing environment where people are going out with 20 visits. Time is of the essence, and often we're quite task-orientated. And if patients aren't giving the information out, they can be overlooked in that environment. So the idea of a template was just to prompt the nurse to explore the areas in case the patient didn't mention it. Yeah, really good idea, because actually most of us, if anybody asks us if we've got pain, we usually always say we're fine, even if well, we have a headache. It's a human, it's a human nature to not yeah. be in pain. And they wanted to be the least trouble possible to their nurse. They really value that nursing care. They don't want to hold them up. There was a lot of that relationship that they, they love their nurses, but they don't want to delay them. And I think we need to drill down into that communication in consultations. Mm. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Julie. That was great. 
And our next speaker is Ayuna Adderley, um, a recent addition to the trustees, or signed up, sort of, which is fantastic. Um, uh, you can find Una's abstract in uh, abstract 34, looking at community nurses' judgment decision making uh, for managing Venus leg ulcers. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm afraid mine is also a whistle-stop tour of a lot of information. Um, leg ulceration is common, it's unpleasant, and it's costly. And the most common cause of leg ulceration is venous insufficiency. And most leg ulcer care is delivered in the community. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Current guidelines, informed by robust research, recommend that all patients with leg ulceration should receive Doppler assessment of ABPI, and those diagnosed with venous leg ulceration should be treated with graduated high compression. But clinical practice is unlikely to completely adhere to these research guidelines because evidence-based practice is also about considering resource issues, about clinical expertise and patient preferences, of course. But national audits, which are shown up here, have established levels of practice that are achievable in the clinical setting in relationship to ABPI and high compression. However, the recent pragmatic audits, shown on the right, suggest that there is some gap between the levels that can be achieved and the levels that are being achieved. Now, it's unclear how widespread this may be, but there is sufficient evidence to cause concern. And since evidence and practice is linked by judgment and decision making, I sought to understand how community nurses make these judgments. The lens model, as shown here, can be used as a theoretical model to study judgment. Now, on the left side, you've got the true state, what actually is the correct diagnosis of a leg ulcer. And on the right side, you've got what the nurse, nurse's judgment is, so what do they think the leg ulcer is. And the accuracy of the nurse is judged by the level of correlation between these, the judgments, their judgments and the correct judgments. And when making these judgments, Nurses will consider various cues, such as ABPI, such as pain, and attach different levels of importance to the cues. But these levels of importance may or may not be similar to the actual importance of these cues. And you can unpack a nurse's judgment by comparing how the nurse has weighted each cue compared to the cue's actual importance. In this study, we constructed 110 clinical scenarios from patient clinical records, and the proportions of venous, arterial, mixed, and uh, unusual ulcers were in line with the UK leg ulcer population. Now, each scenario consisted of a photo and written history which contained the cues that the literature said was relevant, and these are shown on the, on the right-hand side. And these scenarios were presented electronically to 18 community generalist nurses and 18 community tissue viability nurses. And each nurse made a diagnosis and a judgment about compression for each scenario. And they also rated their confidence about each judgment on a one to 10 scale. And an expert panel also made consensus judgments together for each scenario. And these were used as the true diagnoses and treatment judgments. And I, um, logistic regression models were constructed to examine how nurses use the information in the scenarios. Calibration analyses were used to analyze the nurses' confidence about the accuracy of their judgments. And differences between the generalist nurses and the specialist tissue viability nurses were explored using paired t-testing. Uncertainty exists in all clinical environments, but the level of uncertainty um, can be assessed by using correlation to measure how well the agreed signs and symptoms of a condition actually indicate their, that condition, and one indicates perfect correlation. So what we have here is the correlation for diagnosis, which was only 0.63. So the nurses could only reasonably be expected to have an accuracy of up to 0.63. What we found was overall, the nurses achieved an accuracy of 0.48, but the specialist nurses were more accurate than the generalist nurses. For the judgment about whether or not to apply compression, the predictability was 0.88, so there was less uncertainty around this judgment. But again, overall, the nurses only achieved an average accuracy of 0.49, or again, the specialist nurses were more accurate than the generalists. If we look at the cues, the relative importance of the relevant cues is best interpreted as there being 100 points to divide between the cues. 
And for diagnosis, ABPI was the most important cue, and the nurses used this cue appropriately. However, they didn't give enough weight to medical history and appearance, but they gave too much weight to age and pain. For choosing whether or not to apply compression, diagnosis of the type of leg ulcer was the most important cue. The nurses didn't give enough weight to this cue, and the next most important cue was pain, but for nurses, this was one of the least important cues, and the other cues were given more weight than was appropriate, and we found no difference here between generalist and specialist nurses. And finally, to look at confidence. Confidence really matters because overconfident nurses are less likely to seek out more information to confirm or refute their judgments, and underconfident nurses may make more cautious or incorrect treatment choices, such as being reluctant to use high compression even when it would be appropriate. Now, what we're looking at here is a calibration curve, and these plot the proportion of correct answers against the level of confidence indicated by the nurse. So if a nurse's level of confidence about the accuracy of their judgments was absolutely correct, this would be a 45-degree line, which is shown in purple. Curves below this line, the orange line, indicate a tendency towards overconfidence, and curves above the line indicate a tendency towards underconfidence. So for diagnosis, when the nurses indicated that they were more than 40% confident that their diagnosis was correct, they tended to be overconfident. And for compression, when they indicated they were less than 70% correct, confident that their choice was correct, they tended to be underconfident. And there was little difference between the specialists and the generalists. Now, accuracy matters because misdiagnosis and incorrect treatment choices lead to suboptimal healing rates, diminished quality of life, reduced patient safety, and higher healthcare costs. For clinical practice, this study suggests that higher levels of accuracy could be achieved by both specialist and generalist nurses. And when diagnosing leg ulcers, appropriate weight should be given to the cues that are known to be important, particularly the ABPI and medical history. And when making judgments about compression, sufficient weight should be given to the diagnosis and less weight to the other cues. For service provision, in this study, specialist nurses were more accurate, but it's not clear why, although they did spend twice as much time managing leg ulcers as generalist nurses, and this might be a factor. But restricting um, certain aspects of practice to only specialist nurses, although it might improve overall accuracy, it wouldn't be helpful in improving the current performance of generalists, and it might not necessarily translate into meaningful cost savings. So for research, this, model has, this study has set out models for diagnostic and treatment judgments for venous leg ulceration. They provide a starting point for the development and testing of possible decision rules that may help nurses improve both their accuracy and their confidence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Una. Any questions? Thank you very much. I just wanted to find out if you'd identified any heuristics that perhaps the expert nurses were using in their decision making? It's quite possible. It's another part of my PhD, <laughs> which I haven't reported today. But yes, they did appear. In fact, both groups of nurses um, appear to have patterns of thinking heuristics that they did see. Whether they were correct heuristics is another question. But yes, um, but there wasn't time for today. <laughs> but yes, I'd be very happy to talk about that. <laughs> Anyone else? Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And finally, we have Linda Edwards coming to talk to us. Uh, you'll find her abstract in um, abstract number 44, uh, Healing Community Services Systematic Approach Towards Healing Venous Leg Ulcers. Thank you very much, Linda. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to present to you some of the work that we've undertaken in um, Ealing Community Services around venous leg ulceration. Um, venous leg ulceration remains um, a significant health problem. It is very challenging and it continues to afflict at least 70,000 people at any one time. The cost to the NHS is absolutely immense. I work um, for Ealing Community Services, part of Ealing Hospital NHS Trust. It's a borough of West London, 
and has a population of approximately 338,000 people. Uh, about 10% are over 65, and we have a multicultural um, society within Ealing, um, with a 30% um, Asian population. The District Nursing Service within Ealing um, provides community leg ulcer clinics for the population of Ealing, and the Tissue Viability Service supports the district nurses to deliver the evidence-based care within the leg ulcer clinics. Our leg ulcer clinics um, are quite well established. The first clinic um, was uh, developed in Acton in 1992, that was part of the original Riverside Leg Ulcer Project. The clinics are run by the district nurses. They have 16 clinics a week. Each clinic has a four-hour session. Um, there is an increasing demand for this service, and indeed we have a waiting list. We aim to provide evidence-based care for our mobile patients. Um, when we say mobile, we mean patients who can get into a minibus. We have transport to bring the patients to the clinic, so there is access for patients in wheelchairs. Our patients, as I'm sure all of yours, are becoming increasingly complex due to advancing age and their multiple comorbidities. We also have a complex wound clinic, which is run by the Tissue Viability Service, and patients are referred to, to, um, to our clinic as the need arises. So to facilitate um, consistency of running the clinics across the trust, uh, the tissue viability team, we have developed what we call a SOP, a leg ulcer clinic standard operating procedure. And the SOP will detail the roles and responsibilities of the nurses, of the HCAs, the administrators. We have referral pathways to the complex wound clinic and to the vascular clinics. Um, we give details about the administration of the clinics, how to set the clinics up, the equipment <laughs> needed to run the clinic, dressing procedures, infection control, etc., etc. Patients are generally fer referred to the clinic by the GP. However, any member of the MDT is able to refer patients to us, and likewise, patients are able to self-refer. We will treat leg ulcers of all etiologies. However, we do not treat the diabetic foot ulcers because they're seen um, at the diabetic foot clinics, and that's led by the podiatrist. The patients will receive a comprehensive leg ulcer assessment and a referral pathway is available for the vascular clinic at the local hospital. The Tissue Viability Service provides what I feel is a quite a comprehensive training programme. Um, we provide three-day leg ulcer course and this is provided four times a year. All district nursing staff are required to do this course and they're to be is to be repeated every two years. Um, at January 2014, 67% of the district nurses within Ealing Community Services had completed our training. And further training then is undertaken in the clinics through a mentorship scheme. Each clinic has a leg ulcer coordinator and they're responsible for the overall management of the clinics. The district nurses are rotated into the clinics and we hold quarterly leg ulcer clinic coordinators meetings. So looking at healing rates, in the United Kingdom, the healing rates for venous leg ulcers in the community varies quite considerably. Um, and White et al identify that between 11 and 73% healing of venous ulcers can be achieved or has been achieved in six, in, within 12 weeks. Um, the, N, the Supply to Health any AQP, any qualified provider document, states that we should be expecting about 70% healing of venous, simple venous leg ulcers within 18 weeks. And this details what a simple leg ulcer is. 
However, for the more complex venous ulcer, they advocate healing of 70% within 24 weeks. However, within Ealing Community Services, our CCG contract for the district nurses was expecting us to heal all venous leg ulcers, simple and complex, and they wanted 100% healing of these ulcers within 12 weeks. Is that achievable? No. So why weren't we? We, we did not achieve 100% healing. We needed to identify how were we going to capture this information in the beginning. And the way that we captured the information was via Rio. Um, and the district nurses had to input the information when the patient was diagnosed as having a venous ulcer and then when it healed. But the problem was is that the district nurses weren't inputting the data. And hence our healing rates were seemed deemed to be very low. So in addition to the non-reporting, we felt that we could not achieve 100% healing because the majority of our patients are elderly and they are complex due to their comor multiple comorbidities and that is adversely affecting healing. Secondly, the second biggest problem is that the patients weren't being referred quick enough to us by the GPs. The practice nurses were sitting on them, just applying conventional dressings. Um, despite all the training that we were giving the nurses, um, they, we found that they were not applying the appropriate amount of compression according to lankal circumference. And full layer bandaging is our first line uh, treatment for venous leg ulcers and a number of the patients were put in short stretch and again we were questioning the application. So what did we do? Um, we were fortunate to have a tissue viability nurse, two tissue viability nurses to go and work with the district nurses in the clinics um, and help them to overcome the issues that we, we identified. So they helped the district nurses. They spent a lot of work with them facilitating the inputting of data about new venous ulcers onto Rio. We increased the number of patients um, to be treated by the four-layer bandage to 95%. Further training was given in the clinics and the CCG were alerted about the, the delay in GP referrals and more patients were then referred to us at the complex wound clinic. So as a result of that, we managed to increase our healing rates. So between April and November of last year, our overall 12 week healing rate for new venous ulcers was 42% and 67% at 24 weeks. By November um, of last year, um, we managed to achieve 67% uh, at 12 weeks and 83% healing at 24. We, also, um, under, we have also undertaken prevalence, point prevalence studies of venous leg ulcers, of, of all ulcers, and we have found a 50% reduction in venous leg ulcers uh, on the district nurses caseload between March and September of last year. And this is some of the information which details our, um, our point, from our point problem study. Um, with regards to healing rates, um, we are seeing a reduction in the time to heal with new venous ulcers. This information, oops, sorry. Right. This information, as you can see, um, this relates to April 2012, and the maximum or the average time to healing was approximately 60 weeks. That isn't true. It, it, the reason we have got that is because the nurses weren't inputting the healing when the healing occurred on Rio. Uh, but as they got more proficient in putting the data, we were seeing a reduction in the number of weeks taken to heal the, um, the, the new venous ulcers. And um, following the tissue viability's input in um, September, it, on average, it, we're talking about eight weeks was the, the average healing rate. 
Right, so in summary, the current KPI, Key Performance Indicator, presents a significant challenge for us clinicians in Ealing. It is not aligned to evidence and to any qualified, qualified provider guidance. The trust is unlikely ever to achieve 100% um, healing for a, a, a range of legitimate reasons. In conclusion, Ealing Community Services healing rates of new venous leg ulcers are quite good at the moment when we compare them to the national averages. However, Ealing CCG target of 100% healing within 12 weeks is unrealistic and unachievable. The trust, we continue to implement a range of measures to achieve optimal healing rates for venous ulcers and current performance shows a continuing improvement. We are also working at the moment with the CCG for us to come up with some agreement with regards to what is um, a realistic outcome. So I would like to conclude by giving you an insight into what a commissioner is asking of us. What do they want? I had a discussion with one of the commissioners the other day and I thought I would share what, what, she has, uh, what her thoughts are about what the role of the CCG is. And she states that the outcomes CCGs want and clinicians want are much the same. That is best practice treatment for patients so their wounds are managed efficiently and effectively by a cost effective service. Nobody wants a patient to have a long term wound. Funding has traditionally been block arrangements, but it, it is now moving towards an outcome based payment. The service being paid when the wounds are healed. There needs to be a recognition that some wounds won't heal and that services require a guaranteed out income. KPIs are used to determine the service performance and hence payments or pe penalties. The benefits of a service have to be demonstrated. When commissioning a new service, we have to have clinical evidence that the service will make a measurable difference and probably save money long term. This could be through research evidence, but what often works better is having evidence that the service is up and running elsewhere and making a real difference to patients. CCGs are naturally conservative about commissioning new services which are untested elsewhere. And finally, they are not natural innovators although a small number are. The influence has to be based on evidence, not supposition, opinion, or gut feeling. Tissue viability services are evidence-based, and they have to use that to their advantage. Also, helping to cozy out current pathways and highlight the clinical and financial benefits to CCGs of tissue viability services. Evidence, 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 and more evidence presented in a way that GPs understand and articulate clearly what the wins are for the patients in terms of finance and other services. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Limfa. Have we got any questions? I've got one question, is how you have been able to, how have you been able to keep a three-day leg ulcer course running four times a year when we used to have, well, a two-day course, we can hardly get them for a lunch break now. We how have you managed that? We just, we just do it. We, yeah, we, we, yeah, we get the nurses out. Last course was run about three weeks ago, we had 15 people. Well, well done. It's, it's, it's <laughs> high, it is a high priority, I must say, on the managers. We've had a lot of support from them. You um, must have done, only because usually in community services, my experience now is that pressure ulcers have taken over, so leg ulcers are not necessarily given the priority. But with the KPI. Yes, yes, well, that would have got their, yeah. their focus, yes. Okay. Thank, Thank you very you. much indeed. Thank you for attending. Okay.